you know, you, you, my partner's grandfa uh, grandfather participated in D-Day. He saw D-Day, and, um, and yet he talks about the war with ease, whereas Holocaust survivors, 98% fall into silence. They in no way bear witness to, and only 2% do. So even they are apprehensive about it. It's also, of course, a politicization of the event. I mean, you talk about the Holocaust, and inevitably, at one point, it'll veer to the situation in the Middle East, and there things will be said. You know, it's terrible with the Jews in Europe, but look what the Israelis are doing now. And you very quickly slide into this highly politicized debate, which in a sense is irrelevant. I mean, Israel came into existence again in 1948. Holocaust ended in 45. So they are, they should be separate events. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's, it is, in a sense, self-censorship, and we don't gain by that. So I just mentioned um, jokes, humor. Of course, it is not a funny event, but how we talk about something and its reality aren't the same thing. So humor can often be a valid way of discussing a completely serious event. Let me give one example, and it's not from me, it's from Sarah Silverman, the stand-up comic who's Jewish. So the imprimatur of having a, a Jew passing on this joke. So the joke, and I'm not, I won't tell it very well, but the joke is very simple. It's just this. I hate Nazis. They're fucking assholes, but they sure are cute when they're babies. <laughs> now, when she delivers it in the context of a ready to laugh here, it's incredibly funny. Now, what I found really interesting with that joke, the reason I've remembered it, is that it, there's two things about that joke. First of all, it contains a small time capsule of history. It only works if you know the history. If I said, you know, I hate bakers, uh, yeah, but they sure are cute when they're babies, people would say, I don't get, you know, what's wrong with bakers? Why couldn't they be cute as babies? You know, but, so if the joke with Nazis doesn't work, you have to explain. And let's say this was a 12-year-old Korean boy. Totally likely that a 12-year-old Korean boy would know nothing about the Nazis. So you have to explain, oh, well, they were a group in Europe, and they herded these people, and they slaughtered them. So they're... They are held in the West to be incredibly evil people. So in explaining the joke, a knowledge is being passed on. So there's first of all that. Humor only works if you know the context of the joke. So it is a time capsule. And the second thing, too, is that that particular joke asks a very valid question. What did go wrong with those beautiful, blue-eyed, blonde babies? How did we get from blue, beautiful, blue on, blah, beautiful little babies to thuggish SS officers at Auschwitz. What was the crooked route that led to them to become who they became? So now that joke will not at all amuse a survivor, will not amuse a descendant of a survivor, will likely not amuse older Jews. But all the others who are on the outside, it might still be a way to get them to think a bit. It may just be that we approach something horrifying, partly crying, but also partly laughing. Humor isn't necessarily always funny. In the essay that I wrote, I say at one point, you know, humor is a useful vandal. It is a vandal. It is irreverent. But there's something, you know, irreverence can be useful at times in throwing us off balance and seeing us in seeing things in a different light, in shedding new horror on it, in being disrespectful. That's horrifying. Well, that jolts us. So, and, you know, you cannot tell. You, know, you want to go to Hollywood and say, okay, I have a great Holocaust comedy in mind. You know, David Grossman, the great Israeli novelist, in um, Sea Under Love, Sea Under Love as in a dictionary, he has a scene, there's a, in, a, in one of the four parts, he has a character who cannot die. You shoot him, he just, oh God, that hurts, and he's still alive. And there's a scene of him in the crematorium with his editor, he was a children's writer, and he doesn't die. You know, everyone else dies, and you know, he's still standing there. And he was criticized, you know, how can you go in there and it's not, a, it's not a humorous scene, but, you know, he was, you know, how can you go in there, in that inner sanctum of our suffering, and have this fictitious character? He was criticized for that, but I was thinking, well, of course he should go there. If, if you never go there, it'll be forgotten. And I said, it's not a humorous one, but it is a fictitious, obviously it's a fictitious uh, invention. Uh, you know, that's what writers do. We use our imagination to understand, and we don't use the tools of the historians and the survivors. Um, but it is useful in, in opening up that event. Um, so I think it is self, you know, you never see Holocaust comedies. You never see them. Holocaust jokes are either only told by Jews in a, in a specific context where they're somehow allowed to. Uh, it's like only, you know, black people can use the word nigger. Only they can use, say, you know, hey, nigger, only black people can. 
except in a very limited context. Uh, so as I said, there is, we have not normalized relations, there is apprehension, and I think that is stifling uh, uh, um, what we make of the event. And I think it is changing, you know, Jonathan Safran Foer, everything is illuminated. A flawed book, but in some parts extremely funny, really, really funny, but it's deeply serious. Um, Life is Beautiful, it's a bit old now, but remember Life is Beautiful? Um, and other things that aren't, you know, not funny, like uh, uh, Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Um, that's obviously a fiction. The Kindly Ones, the book that won the Goncourt in France, uh, you know, also a fiction. Um, I think we, mean, we need more of those. But I think that's a healthy, that's healthy, I think. You've, of course, using animals is something, you, know, you get asked the question all the time with your fiction, but in this one in particular, I would like to... The, with, Vir, with Beatrice and Virgil, this central, this play in the middle of another of the novel, being a donkey and a, and a howling monkey. What is it that that choosing those animals allowed you to do in the course of telling this story? Well, animals. I like using animals. I'll be using them for my next novel too. Three chimpanzees. Um, they work for me. They're, uh, and that's just spontaneous. I don't know why. There's no necessarily deep reason uh, why I, I've just fallen into that. Um, in the particular case of, of Beatrice and Virgil, um, whereas in Life of Pi, I wanted animals that was magnificent and fearful, so I used a tiger. One that was loathsome, uh, hyena. One that was endearing to us, orangutans. One that was kind of weird and strange, uh, zebra. So I use them because of what we project onto them. Same thing with uh, Beatrice and Virgil. Um, uh, I think. You know, if we had to do a poll of animals that we like, uh, beyond domestic animals, I think donkey would be high up there. I think there's something really likable about a donkey. It looks like it always has a hangover. You know, its head stooped low, it moves its ears carefully, like, please don't speak too loud, I have a real headache. <laughs> it's this really simpatico animal. Um, and so I, I wanted an animal that was likable. And I was trying to, uh, trading on positive stereotypes of Jews rather than negative ones, positive stereotypes of Jews, you know, uh, the, the donkey is held to be hardworking. It's an it's a honest, hardworking animal. Um, Jews have been honest and hardworking. They have endured for centuries. Despite incredible adversity, they have endured. And then monkeys, well, you know, monkeys are clever and nimble. Uh, well, Jews are clever and nimble. They've contributed to the arts and sciences way beyond their numbers. There, there's not that many Jews around, and yet how many great writers, great artists, great scientists, great, you know, political leaders. A lot of the German leadership during the Weimar Republic was Jewish. You know, they were at there. They were there trying to help their country. Anyway, um, so I was trying to find two animals that might sympathetically represent Jews. Um, and I just decided on those, those two. And it's just proportion. And also, it could be that Beatrice represents the body, Virgil the mind. You can read it any number of ways. It's not up to you. Know, I'm just one reader. You are other readers. You can read it any way you want. But I wanted to sympathetic, and this time they're anthropomorphized, whereas in Life of Pi, Life of Pi was hoping the reader would lose himself, lose herself in the animals, and just be fascinated by those animals and, and just be a little eye floating above the Pacific. In, in Beatrice and Virgil, those animals are, like, are meant to be mirrors. They're meant to be, bring you back to your humanity. So um, the, the gaze is um, ultimately different. The gaze, hopefully those animals will become a mirror. And in the next one, I'm using chimpanzees because they are, the greater apes are, are not only genetically close to us, but um, they, 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 if they physically re resemble us quite a lot in their you know, oppos opposable thumb and their, their limbs, their, their physical construct, and that's useful for me. Um, so it's just the, the, the prism that I like looking at. Um, I also like the fact that very few adult writers do it. When we grow up, we leave childish things behind. I'm not sure why we've left behind animals. Um, there's very little adult literature that features animals in a significant way. 